listening to me and my talk about the cooking show today. Uh, I've got a PowerPoint presentation and I've got a little machine here. This machine's turned on, isn't it? Yes. Working properly? All right, good. Okay, so what does Feng Shui say about all this stuff, all this stuff that we have around our house? We're going to have a look a bit of a talk about that. And we're going to talk about how Feng Shui and how symbolism affects our lives. So that's the topic of my discussion today. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about myself first. So let's get straight into it. <laughs> a bit about my family background. I was born in Melbourne, a fourth generation Australian, with a unique obsession to improve the harmony in my environment from a young age. And I lived in my grandparents' house on the corner of intersecting streets, and with a hill to the north and a hill to the south, all the chi would converge in our street corner because we had all that chi coming down, funneling in. And it's not surprising then that we attracted all the neighbourhood strays and the tearaways and all the weird and wonderful people would, would approach us in our house. And uh, this is me at a, at a young age up at Mount Buller. I was always very keen to understand things about the environment and coming from a, a background of... Uh, my father's Austrian, so I always had the, the, the mountains and the water in my blood. And we're going to talk a little bit more about mountains and water and what that relates to it in show. But I couldn't find a decent family photo, so I thought I'd just leave that in the blank. <laughs> my, grandmother, my grandmother was a funny little old lady. She used to collect lots of things. Firstly, do you remember these? She used to collect yes. Bex tablets. <laughs> she used to collect the bottles of the Bex pills. And she had a whole shelf full. And when they got full, she started filling up another shelf and another shelf and another shelf. And, and other things that she used to do, she used to collect newspapers. Oh, and so she'd pop the newspapers on the dining room chairs, you see. So we never actually ate dinner at the dining room table. <laughs> we always used to have all these <laughs> um, uh, uh, newspapers piled up and everything. And of course, well, the rest of my family didn't seem to have a problem with that, but I always did. So I used to spend my weekends cleaning the house. And I used to get out there with the room, <laughs> cleaning the house, <laughs> go from room to room, do the outside, do the inside. And I was particularly interested in doing the outside as well because the way that our house looks outside has a very big impact on the way that people think about us, the people that live in that house, or any sort of building for that matter. So I was the odd one out, a bit like the Beverly Hillbillies. <laughs> but I was, my family we used to call that house the Rosen Ranch. <laughs> and I was the odd one out, so um, I always thought that was a little bit strange. I felt like, you know, the man from the moon or something like that when I was living in my family house. And uh, But when I discovered Feng Shui, I understood or learned to understand why these things affect us and how, for me personally, it affected me a lot more. I mean, I used to spend, as I say, my weekends in the house, cleaning up the house, rather than going out and and uh, you know, being with friends and things like that. Because I had a certain uh, pride, I suppose you would say, but not just the pride, but understanding that our house is a reflection of ourselves. So feng shui, we're going to talk about what feng shui is all about. Now, this is a compass that we use in feng shui. It's called a low pan. So traditional feng shui looks at the space in which we live and also the time in which we live there as well. And in feng shui, we say time is a very important factor because every 20 years, the feng shui changes. And on the 4th of February, 2004, we moved into a new 20-year cycle, which we call period eight. And the number eight, which we have different affiliations which eat with each of the nine numbers, and the number eight represents uh, knowledge and wisdom and stability, and it's a little bit sluggish. But in period seven, Seven is a very dynamic number, a very active number. And we saw quite a bit of difference between period seven and what's happening now in period eight, especially relating to business, the economy. Things have sort of slowed down. It's just that there's a different way of doing business now in period eight than there was in period seven. Because in period seven, number seven represents the mouth and speech and communication. 
So if we're good communicators, good speakers, we can do quite well in period seven. And certainly in the feng shui industry, uh, feng shui became very popular through a number of speakers who became famous worldwide for, for what they do. Uh, it's not necessarily for their knowledge of feng shui, but it was for being able to publicly speak about it and being unafraid to go out there and tell other people all about it. And that's how they were able to promote feng shui. And I can see the same thing happening with the organisers association. You're fairly new association. It's a new industry. It's, it reminds me of what it was like for me when I first started out in feng shui too. There was no feng shui industry as such. And so we've developed, you're at the cutting edge, if you like, of the development of the industry. So that's really exciting, I think. Uh, so with a with our period eight, because eight represents knowledge and wisdom, it's not so much about what we say, but it's about how we can help people in their lives through imparting our knowledge to them. Uh, rather than just say, do this, do that, it's more like how, show them how they can do it and explain why as well. And I even find that an edge in my business too. When I can explain to people why they should move the furniture around the house or why they should change the colour of a certain wall, I get a lot more feedback from the clients and the clients come back to me for that. So people want to know why. They're a bit sick of all that hype about just talking. Okay, so full show is all about the environment. And the environment is a reflection of our personalities. Because when we move into a certain house, we have a certain feeling about that house. And so our personality is drawn towards a particular house. Now, feng shui, what I was interested to uh, when I first discovered feng shui, uh, the, the words feng shui, feng is the top one and shui is the bottom one. Feng shui means wind and water. So when we study about feng shui, we're studying about how does the wind come to a certain location? How does the water, where is the location of water? We're going to talk about that more as we go along. But feng shui is many other things as well. It's a combination of architecture, interior design, philosophy, psychology, mathematics, astrology, astronomy, and a great deal of common sense as well. So because I enjoyed feng shui, I understood, I, and because of course I had a little bit of common sense, <laughs> I thought I'd keep going with feng shui, so I decided to do a course in feng shui. And I did a course back in 1995 to understand a bit about feng shui. When I first went along, I didn't know anything about it. So I found out that it was a combination of all these different things. And then, so I did the course and I found I was really fascinated by feng shui. And because of my background and my understanding of, you know, cleaning up the house, it just seemed natural to me to do feng shui. But feng shui is very different to cleaning up the house. There's a lot of aspects that are similar, and that's why uh, organisers and feng shui practitioners could work quite well together. So I did a course in feng shui, but I didn't do it in this classroom. I did it in another classroom. <laughs> And uh, my master, uh, my, my original teacher, uh, his name is Kevin, he is a, in Melbourne, in Australia, from Melbourne, he introduced me to Master Joseph Yu. And Master Joseph Yu lives in Toronto, in Canada. And uh, so I've uh, been studying with Master Yu since about 1998. And I've been over to Toronto three times. I've also brought him out to Australia to teach feng shui. And uh, I've done many of his courses on the internet as well. And so I've, uh, eventually he asked me if I would like to teach his course, which is called the Feng Shui Professional Course, uh, run by our association, which is the Feng Shui Research Centre. So that's our, our um, the head office of our, of our business. So I teach his course here in Australia. And in 1998, after, uh, in two, 2006, after I'd been studying with him for about eight years, he made me a master of feng shui based on the amount of knowledge that I had about feng shui and what I had uh, contributed to the industry. So in the different courses, of course, I met lots of different people, uh, different uh, students from around the world, whether it was here or in Melbourne at the Seville Hotel, we ran courses there. And uh, also, of course, when I did a lot of study, because I'm studying Chinese, we had a lot of Chinese dinners. <laughs> Chinese, we spent a lot of time in Chinese restaurants, eating lunch, eating dinner. So that was always fun. <laughs> you have to learn to like Chinese food, if you don't. <laughs> and uh, then because of the things I do, and I, I sort of delved wholeheartedly into my subject. 
So I wanted to learn more about Feng Shui. So I did a lot of research and uh, I went into Chinatown in Melbourne and studied the Feng Shui there. And since 1998, I've been running Feng Shui tours of Melbourne's Chinatown. I take people up and down. So I've been getting a lot of publicity over the years through that. And uh, I've been on postcards and small business show. And actually, another show on ABC, which is where I was found to, to come and speak at your conference. And we'll talk about that in a moment. I've also spoken at the International Feng Shui Convention. And in fact, speaking about Howard Choi, that's him right in the middle. So I was spoke, spoken him, with him at the uh, International Feng Shui Convention in uh, Singapore. In, that was in 2005. And then I also spoke in 2006, and I've been to other conferences overseas to speak as well. So, I mean, that's just a little bit of my background. I think it's important for you to understand, you know, that I'm not a beginner in my subject. I, I've been doing it for quite a while. <laughs> so, uh, my most recent uh, presentations were on uh, um, great outdoors. And I did a tour, a, a tour of Chinatown with uh, Jennifer and Tom. I don't, I'm not on a first name basis. <laughs> I just like to say that. <laughs> and uh, that's ava actually available on my website. You can have a look uh, at, the, uh, at the tour that we did. And another person who I'm very friendly with, her name is Karen Kingston. She's a world famous space clearing expert. You know Karen? Yeah, yeah. yeah she lives in Sydney actually. And uh, I have a client who is, uh, works with the ABC and, and works on a lot of documentaries. And my client rang me up and said, oh, we're doing a documentary about people and their, and their stuff and their things. I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't know the name of the, uh, of the presentation or anything like that. Uh, but, um, so I, uh, she asked me if I would like to do a talk. And I said, well, I'm not really an expert in clutter clearing. I said, Karen's an expert in clutter clearing. Uh, so why don't you call Karen? Even though, of course, I always like to speak at any chance that I can get. Uh, but so she called up Karen and asked Karen if she could uh, do this uh, thing for ABC, but Karen wasn't available. So I, by default, I got to do the, the uh, talk, which was a lot of fun anyway. So I got to meet Wendy Harmer, and uh, we did uh, the, present the, um, the show called Stuff, which I'm going to show you in a moment. So did you see the, the show yeah, Stuff yeah, on yeah, the ABC? Yeah. Did you, do you remember me on there? <laughs> I think it was in episode three of stuff. So uh, I, the reason why I've got this page up is because, just to show you, I've done a lot of consultations. Usually what I do is a written consultation on the spot where I give people a report like this. I divide their house up into eight different areas, and I'm going to show you a little bit about how I do that uh, soon. And, uh, and so over the years, I've uh, accumulated a lot of uh, clients and uh, important to keep in touch with our clients. I think our clients, uh, the repeat business or refer referral business that we get for our clients is much more important than any other type of business, or any other sort of advertising or anything else that we can do. That's the most important. So let's have a look at the uh, presentation. Hopefully it will work. <laughs> Actually, what I need to do is get the mouse. When we choose a house in which to live, we do so because we have a certain feeling about that house. And then when we move in, we bring all our stuff with us. And so our house becomes an extension of ourselves, our personality. In fact, we don't actually choose our house. Our house chooses us. Man, Jody's got some bad news for alarming the kids. Well, some houses are luckier than others, and unfortunately this one's a little bit of an unlucky house. An unlucky house? Yeah. You, it's not a life sentence, so they don't have to move, do they? Well, not necessarily. There's a lot of things that we can do to fix the unlucky house. When we have a lot of stuff low down, it makes, our, our, uh, makes us feel more lower makes our spirit lower. So even if you can start to raise some yourself off the ground, that will make your spirit feel more lifted too. That can be a very good door for entering the house to bring more lucky energies into the house instead of the front door. What do you think, Vivian? Does that sound like a good idea? 
Yeah. So you can go from room to room with the smudge stick and make sure that the room gets lots of smoke and the smoke helps to purify the space. Oh, well, there you go. So I'll go to the few yes. minutes and I'll give you that. Take your smudge stick and declutter, my girl. Good luck. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you later. Bye. So, Edwin, do you want to join me? One day to help me go? Is that the time? <laughs> 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 that was all a bit of fun. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about that case study in a, in a few moments. I'm just going to make sure that this works. Okay, so as I say in the presentation there, it, it, our house chooses us. And according to um, our destiny, if you like, uh, we would choose, we tend to choose a certain house. And while we're living there, certain things will happen in our lives. Now, uh, this is Winston Churchill, or Sir Winston Churchill. And Sir Winston Churchill <coughs> said, we shape our buildings, and then afterwards our buildings shape us. So therefore, the longer that we live in a house, the more we become part of that house, and that house becomes a part of us. And so being within professional organisers, well, you probably see quite a lot, uh, a lot of situations where you can tell a lot about what's happening in a person's life just from looking at their house. Isn't that true? Yeah. Internally and externally, what's happening in their life. And do you do it mostly uh, residential or commercial? Both. Both, Both. yeah. Okay. All right, well, commercial is important too, but of course, well, in, in feng shui we always say commercial is very important, but if you have good feng shui at home, then you can be more successful in life in general, and so in your business as well. So it all starts from the home, doesn't it? I think it all starts from the home. If the home is well organised and everything is where it should be, uh, from your perspective as well, then we will be more successful in life. So what causes one person to live in a zen-like environment, uh, which can almost be too simplistic, too, too spartan, if you like, uh, to something like the kitchen of the Lady Teresa and stuff? <laughs> now, actually, you know, I, I was a bit taken aback when I went to do that show because after we'd done all the... Uh, I didn't actually find her, um, the, uh, the location people found her, and when I turned up at the door, she said to me, oh, you've come to help me clean the house. Wow. <laughs> I said, I, 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 I love you, but, you know, we're just going to spend the day here, um, you know, filming, and, uh, you know, as Wendy and I said, let's get out of here as quick as we can. Uh, but actually, you know, there's a serious problem with a person that uh, lives in such a, an environment, and it relates a lot to their personal self-esteem. So, living in chaos is a choice. Now, what creates that choice is basically all in the mind. However the mind imagines, whatever the mind imagines, that's what will happen in our lives. So, the mind is the most powerful tool that we have, more powerful than anything else. And giving the clients a good pep talk is often you know, necessary. Uh, for me, I know I'm a bit like a, a counsellor sometimes as well, and you probably are too. You have to give them guidance and, and counsel them when they're having problems. I see quite a few nods there. So we understand each other. We're in the same field, but in different areas of that field. So now, what is this? Life is like a lump of clay. <laughs> we can mould it and shape it any way we like. It's up to our choices that we make in life. Those choices, of course, uh, are so important and will determine what happens in our life. We can choose the hard road, we can choose the easy road. We've, seen, we've heard that before, but it's always good to remind ourselves that that's the case. So all these choices lead us in different directions. And uh, well, when we, if we start, you see, a lot of people don't like to work on themselves, but they might work on their house indirectly and psychologically. Therefore, by working on their house, they're also working on themselves as well. Because often you probably find, like I do, that people are afraid to change. So if you ask them directly to change, they won't do it. But if you ask them to move their furniture around, they're quite happy to do that. But then they don't realise that in, from the psychological effects that it has, it changes their whole life by changing around their house, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. So, what is clutter then? Clutter is holding on to our pain. Well, firstly, you know, when we have a lot of clutter in our mind, we're just holding on to stuff. And some people just won't let go. 
They just won't let go of either past fear, past trauma. Yeah, but today is is uh, the most important day of our lives. So yesterday is gone. Tomorrow is a dream. Living for the now is the most important. So getting up every morning and living for the now, that's really the most important thing. But a lot of people live in the past because they, you know, they blame, oh, you know, my father didn't like me when I was a kid or I had problems here and there or I grew up in a messy house. <laughs> All these things can hold us back in our lives. But after a while, you know, it, we need to grow out of that. And a lot of people, you know, need to be counselled how to grow out of that. Hanging on to our stuff is a way of holding on to our pain. Yeah. By hanging on to our stuff. Uh, and sometimes people will just hang on to stuff that they don't even need, just because it reminds them of a time, a happy time in their lives. But all they need to do is to be reminded that they can create new future happy times and they can get rid of all that old stuff they don't need anymore. <laughs> that 1970s pants suit. <laughs> <laughs> right. So a question for you. I mean, because I'm wanting to get a bit of feedback from you. What is the worst case of clutter you've ever seen? Anyone want to tell me? Yeah. 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 Um, Go track. Go to track down. And then on terrace now, so long. Go. When you say go track, what is, is that a Sydney expression? I've never heard of that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 you mean like a laneway down the side of the house? Yeah. Oh, I see. All right. I understand what you mean. Like, yeah, okay. So the piles of papers that you Oh, oh, it's a, it's a, it's a professional organiser thing. I'm learning something today. Thank you. <laughs> so is that a go track through the house? So yeah. There were only pathways yes. um, oh. through the hallway because that was the only way through the house. Yes. Um, two of the bedrooms, you could, the one you couldn't get into at all, that was why she brought me. Oh, you couldn't get into the bedroom at all. So where did she sleep? In the bedroom? Did she climb over? Her husband could no longer sleep in there, but she's not. <laughs> because she's uh, got... It, it was stuck on the bed. Oh, I see. So it was on his side of the bed, was it? And so she just crawled into his side. That's a severe case of clutter, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't use the kitchen at all. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So did she take away every night? Was she overweight? Yeah. It's all a symptom, isn't it? That's how it starts. It's all very much. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think um, that, that the interesting thing is, I mean, I, I've had clients like that too, and, and uh, when we go and see them, you know, we learn a lot about how to deal with people and, and their problems, so, and that's part of the learning curve, unless we're professional psychologists, which I'm not, so I've learned a bit, uh, you know, as I've gone along, how to deal with people and their problems and give them good advice. You had your hand up too, didn't you? Yes. Um, I went to a, um, a duplex in um, Subiaco, which is um, mm -hmm. the inner city of um, Perth, yeah. and um, the, the lady and, and gentleman, they um, had cleaners come in, and every week they would um, bring um, banana boxes, cardboard boxes, and clear the table, clear the things downstairs, and take the boxes upstairs. And the boxes were lined as a maze upstairs right to the ceiling. And it got to the stage wow. that they even, they, they couldn't use the bathroom upstairs, and that was the reason they asked me to go there, is because really? one of them had a disability. So therefore, to get to the toilet, well, they couldn't get to the toilet. So, so, every, so, every, week, so every week they would create a new pile of clutter in that house. So they just repeating the same patterns over and over again. And, and, they had, and they were paying someone to come and clean it up for them. Oh, no, council would come and... Oh, okay, so it was a home help, but it, still. Yeah, but, they, but we get stuck in a rut, don't we? We get stuck in a rut and, and don't know when to get off the treadmill, so, so to speak. Health, health and safety. Yes, of course, yeah. And, and did they actually bathe? <laughs> they couldn't get into the bath. <laughs> <laughs> and what about your case of class? Um, I was um, in actually in desperation phoned a television channel a couple of years ago and the whole team had come and totally fixed everything up. Really? Back on so the TV station came and fixed she her house up for her? And, and now, three or four years later, back 
Back to it again. Yeah, well, the funny thing is that she's made she made a decision to change her life, and then maybe she found it all just too confronting, and she had to go back to the way it was before. Yeah. To get more stuff. To get more stuff. Yeah. More money than sense. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's tricky, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, I've had a number of quarters. A number of quarters. Yeah. Yeah. You mean all the blinds were closed, yeah. it was dark in the house? Yeah. Got there, she wouldn't look at me, she's extremely uh -huh. overweight and yeah. you know, mm -hmm. just kind of said, come in and everything was covered in sheets and there's this little trail that you can walk through. Uh -huh. uh, another goat trail. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she's just sleeping on the lounge, she couldn't yeah. get into a bedroom. There's plastic bags and wow, stuff wait. everywhere mm. on the floor, food included. Mm. She had really? a deep four drawer filing cabinet, <laughs> <laughs> so that was fantastic. Did she have some traumatic experience in her life that had caused her to be this way? Um, I think that was an abuse situation. Yeah, yeah. So think sometimes we use all that stuff as a sort of a protective thing. Yeah. To protect to keep you feel safe and for some re some reason, yeah, some yeah. traumatic experience. Yeah. I was yeah. just gonna say, um so I I looked around the room while people were just talking about describing different clients and I could see some people going, other people going, and I they were just saying, there's probably people sitting in this room that would go into those jobs and love it yeah. and yes. do the most amazing job. And if you are one of those people, you need to let the, those people that went, no. So yes. that you can keep that Yeah, because you've got to take the good jobs with the bad jobs. Do you all like it? Okay. Well, one more. I want to. I don't want to. Oh, you want to add something? Sure. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yes, okay, so, they, so do you advise them to go and see a psychologist in that case as well? Yes. So you have a, a list of psychologists that you can refer to? Okay, sorry, just one more. Yeah. I just wanted to guess, in the last chapter meeting, we had this discussion about that it's, it's not our worst case, it's so much clutter, but we just asked around what kind of issues seem to creep up with you. Ah, yes. And yes. we've realised that everybody has reoccurring issues. Like, yes. I, yeah, I can share this here. I get a lot of people who have dead children or very late in pregnancy and stuff like that. I ah. just seem to get that. So that's the issue. Did but you say children who have passed away? Yes. Okay. Oh, yes. All right. So, but so, I seem so to get this and issue. Tara gets different <coughs> issues. So mm -hmm. I think they attract the people and then. The you, you oh, that's interesting. So issues. different consultants are attracting different types of clients. I think clients. you do yes. attract, yes. attract different kinds of clutter, yeah. but you definitely have reoccurring themes yes. in what issues causes all the clutter. Yes. And we do all know mm -hmm. that it's not just a, it's not a problem. So it's always some sort of very traumatic experience that causes someone to, to create a lot of, of, of clutter. I don't know. I don't know what caused my grandma to um, collect newspapers. <laughs> I don't think she had anything traumatic. But, yeah. I, I think my, in my grandmother's case, it was uh, that my grandfather didn't pay her enough attention. Yeah, so, so she was sort of crying out different countries. <laughs> it's a cry for help, isn't it? So, the, 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 Safety is a big issue too, isn't it? So that, that's fascinating, isn't it? Okay, so let's move on then. Um, <coughs> see, everything around us is all about energy. And so what we see, even the intangible things, the tangible things, the things that we can see and touch, even those are made up of energy too. And we can relate that back to Einstein's theory of uh, relativity, E equals mc squared. Now, I'm not a, I'm not a, a, um, 
a, a quantum physicist or anything like that. But I do understand a little bit about how uh, energy and matter... Whoops, it went back. Yeah, okay. Where's my, the rest of the quote there? You've got it in your handout, actually. Do you have a handout for today? Oh, yes, yeah. Yeah. Now, someone yeah, yeah. called, say yeah. they yeah. quote to me. I don't remember what I have. Oh, yes, of course. Matter and energy are different forms of the same thing. Yes. And that's really it. So, so the things that we have around us now, E equals an energy is equal to, the, to mass times the speed of light squared. Now, what it really means is that mass if it's accelerated to a fast enough pace, will turn into energy. So all, all mass is actually another form of energy. That's basically what they're saying there. And it relates to uh, feng shui in quite an interesting way. Albert also said an interesting quote here, which I thought was uh, suitable for today, was that everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. Because if it's too simple, then it doesn't work, does it? <laughs> so, it, look, I, I don't mind having a little bit of clutter. I mean, my office, I was afraid coming here to this conference. <laughs> so I made sure that when I left Melbourne this morning, my office was tidy. <laughs> in case you ask me. <laughs> <laughs> You've done your jobs and I didn't even have to call you in. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, look, I don't mind a little bit of clutter in the office because it shows that you're busy. <laughs> so I don't mind a little bit, you know, a few piles there. If it's if it's a zen-like environment, then it, then there's nothing, there's no nothing going on there. So I don't mind a little bit of something there. I don't know if you agree with me. You probably don't. So. A work in progress, that's right. Okay. That's my excuse for my, my office, yeah. <laughs> but I, because I work on a lot of different projects, I, I run full show tours of Chinatown, I have a shop at the big market, I run courses and workshops and I talk around the place and, and, so, and I do consultations. So yeah, I think that one way to spread ourselves out in our business is if, if like, for instance, my consultation at certain times of the year are a bit slower, like they were around you know, after financial year this year, a little bit slower. So I do more feng shui tours or, or I go and work in the shop more and, and develop some products or whatever. So there's other ways that we can develop our business to help broaden our, ourselves out. And each different arm of my business, I also get consultants from that, I mean consultations from that. Okay. So even a rock has chi because inside the rock is, uh, and is, everything is made up of atoms and inside those atoms there's a nucleus and there's an electron spinning around the nucleus. So even the most inanimate object has uh, some chi, some energy inside of it. So we, we already heard what is chi, chi is energy. So feng shui is a study of chi, of the energy in the environment. Now, we are also affected by energy as well. So, here, this is a picture of me and my family. I actually found one on top in Billy. <laughs> That's my grandfather. He's 99 this year. <laughs> so, so, keeping an active mind, I think, has been the secret for him. So, in feng shui, the basic thing that we always talk about is yin and yang. Yin and yang are two opposite forces that come together to form a whole. Now, once that you're totally mesmerised, now I can say whatever I want. Empty, leave the room. So, yin and yang, yang and yin. Now, in Chinese philosophy, and not just feng shui, but acupuncture and traditional Chinese medicine, yin and yang are the two fundamental principles. So, you all know about yin and yang? Yeah. So, yin, yin is the dark, the quiet, the passive. Side. And yang is the active, the bright, the the light side. So, which colour do you think is yang and which is yin? White is yang. White is yang. Very good. White is yang and black is yin. Now, but inside white, the white part, you have a dot of yin, and inside the black dot part, you have a dot of yang. That shows that within yin, yin and yang exist with within each other as well. Now, how can we relate that philosophically? We can relate it. 
in lots of different ways in our lives. For instance, our lives go up and down and up and down in cycles. And when they go up, it's like we're in a bit of a high. So that's very yang. And then sometimes we have to come down off that high. So that's yin. So life goes up and down like that. Uh, a day and a night goes up and down like that. We wake up in the morning, we're active, we're bright. Hopefully. <laughs> and then we have a great day. If we wake up on the right side of the bed, we always have a good day, don't we? <laughs> so, uh, but yin and yang, if, if, um, uh, if uh, we want to keep balance in our lives, we need times of yin and we need times of yang. And we also need places in our house where there's yin and yang as well. So yang is open and active and bright. So there's yang rooms in our house that represent that open and active and bright energy. What, which rooms do you think they would be? Living room. Kitchen, family room, dining, office as well. Anywhere where we have activity. What about entrance hall? Entrance hall, that's a yang room. So yang rooms can be decorated a bit brighter, a bit lighter as well. Uh, and so, and yang rooms definitely need more energy, like more space. Well. Whereas the yin rooms, we can like, a yin room is the bedroom, so that's the, the primary yin room. That's where we sleep. So we can decorate the yin room in a more subtle shades, darker colours if we want to. Nothing bright, nothing too active looking. So we don't like circles in a bedroom, for instance. His circle is a very yang shape. So we say circle is the most yang shape. Square is the most yin shape. That's why we like Chinese coins. They're, they're considered lucky because they're round, which represents yang, and they have a square in the middle, which represents yin. So yin and yang, in, in all Chinese, even in Chinese art, you will also see, always see a combination of yin and yang. So something active, like a, a scene, a landscape scene, you'll see a lot of sky, and then you'll see a mountain. So the sky is yang, and the mountain is yin. So in our lives, we have yang periods of our lives and yin periods of our lives. And that's the most fundamental thing that we can express according to feng shui. And, if we, and understanding that principle, it can help us to be more harmonious in our life. Because we know that even if we're going through a bit of a rough time, that cycles, everything goes in cycles. So it's going to, to work, all work out in the end. And so if we have that philosophy towards life, we'll be more happy in our lives. So feng shui is all about the studies of mountains and water. So mountain is the yin energy and water is the yang energy. Now why do you think water is yang? Because it moves. It's fluid, it's movement. And water in feng shui also represents wealth. Why do you think water represents wealth? Abundance. It's life, yeah. What can we do with water? What do we do with it? We drink it, we, 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 grow it, we, we sustain ourselves, we grow crops, we have commerce, we have shipping, we have trade, import, export, all that sort of thing. So water, agriculture, so water re represents wealth. And when we have water in the environment, it can help to stimulate our wealth. But actually in feng shui, we need to put water in the correct place. Because if you build a swimming pool in your backyard, you will activate the chi in that area. So it depends on whether the chi in that area is good, whether you should activate it or not. Uh, if you put a swimming pool in the wrong place it, and activate the wrong type of chi, then it can bring bad luck to your life. We call good luck bad luck. I don't like it, look, using that word good and bad, actually. I just usually say, Sometimes it's better than others. <laughs> I think that's a bit more subtle, especially if we're dealing with clients. We don't like to, I don't like to go into someone's house and say, oh, your house has got bad feng shui. Oh, this is awful. <laughs> so I never do that because we don't want to make our clients feel bad. <laughs> it's all about how we can do to help them, isn't it? So how do mountains and water, how does it all work? It's an ancient wisdom, but we can use it in modern times. And in feng shui, uh, the, the principles go back thousands of years, but we still use it in modern times. And there's different techniques that I use to calculate feng shui. 
Even though it comes from China, it still can be applied. And we don't have to make our house look like a Chinese uh, temple or like my shop with all the stuff hanging around everywhere. <laughs> it doesn't have to, you don't have to hang Chinese uh, um, decorations around your house to have good feng shui. It can be very subtle. It doesn't have to be something that you can tell that it's been done. In fact, the best feng shui, you don't even know that it's been done. Okay, so just going back to our case study with Wendy Harmer, let's talk about why I said that the house was an unlucky house. Now, I, you see, I, as I say, I don't like to use that terminology, but when, the, when, you say, when you're talking to the media, you have to be quite careful because you say one thing and they think, aha, that sounds like a good hook, so they want, they want to run with that. And when I told her that, she said, well, you have to say that on, as part of the presentation. So. I thought, okay, I'll say that, and then we'll work out on ways and we can overcome these things. Um, my, the, the lady involved in the uh, in, in the talk uh, in her house, uh, she was uh, very nervous about it going on TV, and I didn't blame her. And what I actually <laughs> said to her was that um, I would come over there because even though she hadn't employed me as a consultant, I was willing to go over there and help her clean up her house. But she had to tell me that she was going to make a commitment to do that. And so that we could take some pictures up before and then after. And I said that we could put the after photos on the website to show people what she'd done after she'd cleaned up her house. But she wasn't willing to make the commitment. So, so she asked me to, you know, can you help me clean up my house? But, but when I actually ended up offering to help her clean up her house, because not only did it look good for her, bad for her, but it looked bad for me too, so I wanted her to clean up her house to see, you know, how, what can we do to help her? So she's, there's people can see a result, people can see an improvement, but she didn't want to make that improvement. Uh, so you know, it, it has to be a commitment on the part of the people, doesn't it? So when they call a consultant in, whether for feng shui or for you know, clearing, uh, organising your house, uh, they still have to make that commitment and we have to uh, talk them somehow into making that commitment. And well, of course, the commitment is not just to pay us money to come and see them. It's more of a um, spiritual or psychological commitment that they really do want to improve their lives. So this is the, uh, let me see, this is the plan of the house. And, and in feng shui, because I use a compass, it, the compass is called a low pan, that's the big red thing that I showed you earlier on. I take a compass reading of the house. Now this house was facing east. And what I do is I divide the house up into eight separate areas. And each one of those areas has a different type of chi. Yes? Yeah. With the compass, does yeah. it work differently on the northern hemisphere? Compass will always be the same. Yes, no, I know, but yeah. the sun is coming from a different side. Oh, yes. Australia. Well, people often ask me that question. What do you do with feng shui in the southern hemisphere? Because there are people that have written books that say we should change feng shui for the southern hemisphere. But when we use a compass, the compass is based on a measurement of the Earth's magnetic field. And that doesn't change between the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. So basically, the people who write that we should change feng shui they're basing it on the location of the sun, or they're basing it on the weather patterns, or, the, or where does the cold wind come from. Uh, but uh, those things, of course they're important, and we also in Feng Shui, when we I design a house or work on houses, I have to explain, uh, you know, where's the best place where they're going to get a nice northerly aspect, and that would of course be a southerly aspect in the northern hemisphere, but that won't affect the calculation that we use for Feng Shui. So the people who say change from shows for the Southern Hemisphere are wrong, actually. But I'm going to go and speak about that in Hong Kong at the International Feng Shui Convention in February next year. That's my topic. So I've been, I get that, asked that question a lot. So based on when a house is built, it's built within a certain 20 year period of time. And when th this house was built between 1944 and 1964. So that makes it a period five house. So you put the number five in the middle and then fly the other numbers around in a certain sequence. You see how that sequence is? They're called the flying stars. 
And we call each number a star because a star, the stars have different characteristics and different personalities. So they're not just numbers, they're sort of living spirits, if you like. And they come in and influence our house in different ways. So the number five goes into the centre and the house is facing east. So you see here on our chart we have south at the top. Usually when we draw maps, maps we put north at the top but when we work in feng shui we put south at the top because south is the most yang direction uh, so the house is facing east so the number three will go into the center together with the number seven oops and then all the other stars will fly around and you end up with a grid with all with different numbers in each grid and each one of those numbers as they fly into our house they will affect our lives in different ways. So on the right hand side we have what we call the water star. And water star looks after our wealth. Just like water represents wealth. The mountain star looks after our health and our, it affects our personality as well. So the mountain star, where, where we're sleeping, the wall where we sleep has a certain type of energy and that energy will affect our health, our personality, and our relationships. And feng shui is particularly susceptible to children. So it's easy, when, if you have a, a difficult case where, let's say they complain that the children are very unruly, try moving the bed to a different wall because that would change the chi, change the energy where they're sleeping. And when we sleep, we've spent eight hours a day there, so that chi will affect us a lot. And children, will change, their personality will change quite dramatically when they move from place to place or from room to room. So that's what we call the mountain star and the water star. And you have a mountain star and a water star in every section of the house. So looking at this house, here we have, when we talk about water, water is the yang energy. So we say yang energy is related to the entrance hall as well. So the most important place when we walk into a house is what chi do we bring in through the front door of the house. So through the front door is, we, here in this case, through the front door, because the front door is in the uh, east, and in the east we have the number five. Now, number five, the personality of number five, he's called the emperor. He's a bit of a tyrant, he's unpredictable, he brings lots of ups and downs in life. And so, when, in chatting with a lady who lives here, I said, what's your life been like? She said, it's been very up and down. She said, we were married, now we're divorced. She said, I've had a lot of problems since I've been living in this house. And, and I said, well, which way do you walk in? And she said, I always walk in through the front door. And the front door, because we see here on the chart, the front door has the number five. So when she brings the number five into the house, she brings all that, uh, that unlucky energy into the house. So when I say this is an unlucky house, it, I always, I've never seen a house with the number five at the front door that is unlucky, because the number five also represents uh, death. So the only thing it would be good for would be a funeral parlor. <laughs> they could actually be very prosperous in the house facing east, you know, period five house. <laughs> but, uh, well, you know, we're not going to live there, are we? <laughs> so, number five is, uh, we call him five yellow. And number five is earth. Now, I'm going to show you about what the five elements are all about. But let's look at the other number. The other number that is important, oh, going backwards. Yeah, the other number that is important there is the number eight. Number eight is in the uh, east, west, north, south, of course, isn't it? So there's the number eight, we call the number eight, eight white. Now we're in period eight at the moment. So number eight is uh, an important star to bring prosperity in, which is why I said, don't use the front door of your house, because when you walk in the front door, you bring the number five into the house. I said, the only thing that you can do to cure the number five is to put a chiming clock in the door, in the front door, because chiming clock represents metal, and the sound of metal helps to disperse the negative energy, which is why in space clearing they use a lot of um, singing bowls or bells or any sort of metal sound. And quite often you see in feng shui even we use wind chimes as well. Then I, this is where we're sitting when the little girl said, "No, 
she thought it was a bad idea. <laughs> but the reason why I suggested that is because the number eight actually came in through that door. So by using, changing the way people come into the house, and this happens a lot with people who have a lot of clutter in their house too. They just start to get uh, bad feelings and start to have a bad life by living in a bad house. And so but if, they, if you see a person that has a lot of bad luck in their life, maybe they can try changing the way they enter the house. Use a different door to enter the house. Maybe they can bring different type of energy into the house. Now, I, don't, I call this the wheel of confusion because <laughs> uh, it can be a very uh, complicated subject and, and that's why it's taken me 13 years to become uh, a master of feng shui to get where I am. Uh, but I do believe that feng shui is, uh, well firstly, I have a quote here from Confucius, talking about confusion. Uh, to learn without thinking leads to a confused mind and to think without learning leads to a waste of time. So I think that that's interesting because when we're confused, then we're thinking, actually. If we're not confused, then, you know, it's like we don't care about it. So the confuse your clients the more you can and then they'll think more deeply about it. <laughs> anyway, maybe that won't work. But I do think that as uh, feng shui consultants and uh, professional organisers, we can actually work well together because we have our expert area of expertise and you have your areas of expertise. I usually don't look inside people's cupboards, for instance. Uh, I will go around and if they have a lot of clutter, if they have goat trails in their house, I will tell them that feng shui doesn't like too much yin energy because yin is clutter as well. And when, if we want new things to happen in our lives, we need yang energy. So nice and open and bright and active. Now, just talking a little bit about symbolism, because I think that's important as well, because whatever we have in our home, whatever we decorate our home with, it, it is a reflection of our personalities as well. So, I read a book about helping yourself with psycho-symbology by Theodore Lawrence, and he says that through symbols we're having a direct communication with our right brain, and our right brain is our, the, the subconscious. It controls the more spiritual side of our lives. So everything that we decorate our home with, every symbol that we have in our home, is a direct response to our right brain, the unconsciousness. And when we look at something, it will give us a certain feeling about it. And that's on a spiritual or a uh, the feeling level. So that's all right brain stuff. And this quote is actually in your handout too. So you've got, what you've got in your hand out is the slides of, of, the, of here, except the ones of me, you know, clearing up my house and stuff like that. <laughs> now, dragons. Uh, just a bit about feng shui symbolism. Dragon represents strength and power and peace and good luck. And people often ask me, you see, when I first started doing feng shui, I didn't really sell products or anything, but people always ask me, oh, what does a dragon mean? I have a dragon in my house, where should it be? Uh, I have a frog, which way should his face he face when you put him at the front door? What does this all mean? So I had to learn about these things, just because you know people expect me to know, because it's part of Chinese symbolism. But it's, it's actually symbolism. It's not really feng shui, but we call it feng shui symbolism. And so, but we don't need to have, as I said, feng shui objects to have that symbolism. The frog represents uh, wealth, uh, lucky coins to put on the front door mat for good luck. Uh, symbols for protection. We have the, the bagua, which is a very strong symbol for protection, which usually hangs above the front door. And that helps to protect the house. The reason why is because the trigrams, these figures, represent perfect harmony. Inside or Usually above the front door facing out, but you could put them in a window facing out as well. Now a symbol is a term, a name or even a picture that may be familiar in daily life, yet it possesses special or specific connotations in addition to its conventional and obvious meaning. What a wordy quote that is. <laughs> well, I've got that in your hand so you can think about that. But even if we just think about what Jung is saying here, he says that a symbol is familiar to us, but it has other connotations, things that we might not consciously recognise. 
But everything in our home is a symbol for something. And when we decorate our homes, we should only decorate our homes with beautiful objects that remind us of happy things. Uh, like if someone's looking for a partner in life, for instance, don't have single objects all around the house or pictures of lonely single women on the walls. <laughs> That's not going to work. <laughs> Pictures of like that. I often see that lighthouse picture, you know, with the waves yeah, crashing yeah. towards it. Doesn't that make you feel scared? <laughs> make me feel scared. <laughs> Do you know that, that there was a man there? Yes. And yes. It was, he was washed off. Oh. The moment before they took that, well, they took that photo just after he'd gone. Is that correct? Photograph him there. Really? Maybe that's why you've got that picture. Maybe that's why we get a bit of a scary feeling. Yeah. feeling about even just looking at it. Yeah. Really? Maybe that's why we get a bit of a scary feeling about even just looking at that photo. Yeah. Yeah. It's a powerful, I know, yeah. the forces of nature, how powerful they are. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I don't want that. That lighthouse yeah. was built and it's standing against that. Well, that's, that's true. That's really powerful. That's, that's a good point because the lighthouse represents human beings' contribution to the environment uh, being something that we built. Right? So how we can... Uh, uh, you can turn it around, like that's true. How can we sustain ourselves under adversity? <laughs> well, I would look at it. Well, that's right. You can. I, I, well, I've, my mind has been turned around today. So, but I always look at that picture as being something that is very. Uh, to me, it's a little bit scary or lonely. And I see people with that picture, usually they say, oh, I like that picture. And I say, well, I like that picture too, but it depends on what you want in your life. And I've had a couple of cases where people have wanted a partner in their life and they've got this you know, solitary lighthouse being uh, ravaged by, the, by, the, by nature. And I think, well, that doesn't relate to that. So the symbolism of, around that is important. Yeah. Excuse me, Jody. Yeah. The period five house. Well, well, she can either demolish the house, she can move out, and she can change the entrance hall of the house, or she, if she renovates the house, she by renovating and do a complete renovation of the whole house, moving everything out of the house, moving herself out, then she can change it into a period eight house. Because when if, when a house is built, so if a house is re Furbished completely, you change the age of the original house, and that would be much better for her. Yes, so any house that's built after 2004 is period eight. I, I don't have, I'm running out of time, I'm sorry. Yeah. So I just wanted to get through here. Now, this is uh, interesting because we talk about water and how water represents wealth. So all the creatures that live in the water also represent money too. So in China, here where I go to buy my stock from my shop, uh, I saw this wonderful uh, image of fish. Fish represent wealth, of course, wealth and abundance too. So we often see images of fish that have that meaning of wealth and abundance. And that's all made with flowers, by the way. Pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, and when you see some modern symbolism as well, something like uh, fish, goldfish representing prosperity. Uh, I would suspect that this company is actually uh, directing their uh, marketing to the Chinese community because Chinese people know that goldfish represents wealth. Yeah. Uh, it, all, all the different symbolism of the different objects mean different things. And when we look at the symbolism of, of how we design and build the architecture in our environment, we can see what does it actually mean. Now, in feng shui, we have five elements, fire, <coughs> earth, metal, water, and wood. And each one of those elements has different meanings and different colours. So, but in colour symbolism, uh, which is where I got the quote from Theodore Lawrence, he says that certain colours represent certain things. So if you want a copy of this document here, which is too small in your handout, uh, send me an email, and I did pass around a, um, a form there. Uh, if, if I received your name on there, then I will certainly send you a copy of this document. Uh, otherwise, you're welcome to send me an email and I'll send you something about the psycho-symbology of colours. Now, feng shui tips. Uh, I've got some feng shui tips for the home, for business, for the environment, but I've only got about one minute left because we, I think we chatted too long about people's clutter because I found that personally fascinating. Uh, so let's, you'll see actually what I've 
in the handout there, I've got a set of uh, five books. Feng Shui Tips for the Home, for Business, for the Garden, for the Environment. And that's my set of books uh, there. And in, uh, when we're talking about the environment, we talk about Qi, which is good energy. And then we talk about Sha Qi, which is negative energy. So always try and avoid different forms of Sha Qi. And it's obvious when you look at those that they are sort of negative. Especially the, the one in the middle is a bit more obtuse. But if you have a building or anything sharp pointing towards you, that's what we call a form of Sha Qi, or negative energy. So different sites have different qualities uh, based on the five elements and uh, in terms of the location of a site, some will be more prosperous than others. In the home though, when we're looking at feng shui for the home, uh, well the first thing of course we know is avoid clutter. <laughs> And that's just, I, I do get them, I do get them quite a bit, but maybe not as much as you, because that's, that's specifically why they're called, they're crying out for help, aren't they, when they come to see you, or when you go to see them. Uh, keep the entrance nice and open, because the entrance is yang. So that's an important area to make sure it's kept open. Uh, modify a long corridor. We don't like long, narrow corridors. But see, here this one is interesting because at the end is a beautiful feature. So it can be simple, but if, if you have a long narrow corridor, there's lots of ways to slow the chi down so it's not flowing too fast down the long corridor. And sit or sleep with your back against a solid wall. That's very important for feng shui too. So try not to sleep under a window. Avoid red in a bedroom. Not too much yang, because red is the most yang colour. It's a lucky colour, but it's the most yang colour. So I, I couldn't imagine me sleeping in this. This is one of my clients. She loved this place. <laughs> she designed it specifically like that. But at least it's tidy, isn't it? <laughs> Full show for business. Anyone a girl guy? Yeah. <laughs> I was a girl guy too. Remember that? Be prepared. <laughs> yeah. Chance favours a prepared mind. Be prepared and you will be lucky. So we have three types of luck, heaven luck, earth luck, and what we call people luck. So heaven luck is about our astrology, our destiny. Uh, earth luck is about feng shui, because it's about being in the right space and having a supportive environment and also being there at the right time as well. And man luck, or people luck, is the luck that we have by leading a happy life, by getting out of bed in the morning and on the right side of the bed and having a happy day. It's all depending on our attitude to life, isn't it? So be prepared and you will be lucky. So I like that. I think that's good for organising too. Sit in the position of power, not with your back to the door. Feng shui for the garden. Well, it doesn't really relate to organising, but I suppose it does. Do you, do you get many people asking you to organise their garden too? Yeah, you, you pulling out weeds and stuff? No? Garage, garage and pot plants and all that stuff clutter and other stuff. Water, well we've talked about how water represents wealth. Uh, the four main elements in the garden are water, rocks, plants and architecture. That's in, the, in a traditional Chinese garden. Water, rocks, plants and architecture. So here we have a bridge. A bridge is a form of architecture or a pagoda. A pagoda is a form of architecture too. And, oh, What's happening there? Okay, uh, I also wrote a book about how to use mirrors in feng shui. And people often ask me, oh, is mirror at the front door bad luck? Well, it all depends on what sort of chi it draws in. Because when you look in a mirror, you can see the image outside. So in your work, if you're looking in a mirror and you go to someone's house and the mirror reflects an ugly scene outside into the house, then it's in the wrong spot. Because that mirror will draw that chi into the house. So even though we're not doing any calculations and mathematical formulas, you can still use that analysis and say, well, you know, the mirror is going to draw in certain uh, things that are considered lucky because just because it's a form of sha chi, negative energy, uh, mess, dirt outside, noise, all different types of things that we can see. Uh, and if you want to, I will also email you a copy of uh, what are the five different things based on sight, sound, smell, feeling, and the objects around our house too. So those are my 20 ways, those are my set of books, and I do have a few that I brought with me today if anyone wants to purchase one, they're $20 each. 
So everything around us is, is symbolic and we express our emotions, desires and aspirations through our visual creations. These creations express how we wish to live. By understanding symbolism, we can remove the obstacles that restrict us and then our lives open up in unexpected ways. So by understanding a little bit about how the things that we use to decorate our homes with and just looking at it from a point of view of is that object wonderful, ask the people, what do you think of that object? And if they say, oh, well, I don't really like it, but someone gave it to me and so I can't throw it away, well, they probably won't even remember that they gave it to you. Or even if they do, people don't expect... Like, I don't give a gift to someone and expect that they're always going to like it. That's why gift-giving is so difficult. <laughs> uh, so so but when people understand that, then they might be more willing to let stuff go as well. Uh, but our lives, once we let stuff go, we get rid of the old, then we make way for the new. And that's how our lives can open up in unexpected ways. So, thank you very much. And I hope you have Excellent. Thank you very, very much. Um, that is one of uh, Australia's experts and uh, very, uh, great slides, really great slides, very interactive and everything. It was nice, very nice indeed. So you'll be around for a while or are you going to shoot off back to Melbourne or? No, no, I'm here. I'm here. Okay. Oh, that was lovely. Oh, great. Okay. And where's that thing going now? Okay. You going back? No? Okay. Good. All right. Terrific. Um, we now are going to move on to our next presenter, which is about home staging. We'll be here at lunchtime. Yeah, okay, terrific. And um, this is a, a new income stream for a lot of you, and there's a very, uh, what seems to be a very profitable income stream for 